Testing, testing. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Cool. Let's go. Whew, what a week it's been. Truly. I'm Alex. And I'm Emily. And welcome to What a Week. You want it, we got it. We're bringing you the top news and pop culture stories you need to be in the know. Let's dive right in. Okay, guys, this week we have a special episode dedicated to voting. That's right. Get your ballots out because today we're breaking down all 12 props on the California ballot. Yes, and then we're going to talk to you about some voting deadlines and tips to make sure that your ballot gets counted if you're voting by mail. And just so you know, we did our research. For transparency, our sources for this are LAist, Cal Matters, the LA Times, and the California Election Voters Guide. Okay, so let's get into it. First, we're going to start with Prop 14. So what is Prop 14? So this is a prop that would authorize bonds that would continue stem cell research. So this would issue $5.5 billion in funding to an existing state stem cell research institute, and this would support research of diseases like Alzheimer's, heart disease, cancer, and strokes. So a yes vote for this would mean that this $5.5 billion in funding goes to the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, and this was established in 2004 by voters. And uh, a yes vote also means that 1.5 billion of these funds specifically go towards the research and treatment for diseases of the brain and central nervous system. A no vote means that the Stem Cell Research Institute would not get more funding, but it's already on its last legs from the funding that it got back in 2004. So what are the arguments for and against this? Arguments for are stem cell research is always valuable and this would aim to treat millions of people in California and research would be significantly delayed without it. Okay, so the arguments against are that the Institute hasn't yet pr produced the promised life-saving treatments that it said it would back in 2004. And also that 1.5 billion going specifically towards that research, towards um, the nervous system and the brain would kind of hamper the Institute's flexibility to respond to changing needs. So those are kind of the arguments for and against Prop 14, but it has all to do with giving that $5.5 billion in funding to stem cell research in California. Do you know what would happen if the prop didn't get approved and what would happen to that 5.5 billion dollars do you know i don't know what would happen to that 5.5 billion dollars but basically right now the institute only has 30 million dollars left from the billions of dollars it got back in 2004 so it really is on its last kind of leg going and it needs that funding to be able to continue the treatment and research yeah. for everything it has going on wow super interesting thanks for breaking it down alex yeah, of course. And now we're going to talk about Prop 15, which is all about how much businesses and corporations pay on property taxes. The prop increases funding sources for public schools, community colleges, and local government services by changing tax assessment of commercial and industrial properties. So since 1978, all property taxes have been based on the purchase value, not its current value. Prop 15 would change that. So basically, it would tax commercial and industrial properties worth more than $3 million based on the current market value instead of purchase price. This could bring in between $6.5 billion to $11.5 billion in new funding to local governments and schools. A yes vote means property taxes on most commercial and industrial properties worth more than $3 million would go up in order to provide funding for the local government and schools. A no vote means nothing changes. So arguments for this prop say it closes property tax loopholes that benefit corporations when they buy a commercial building for cheap by taxing them based on current value. Right now, when you buy a commercial or an industrial building, you get the same benefits as if you're buying a home. So you can buy it for $1 million and then 10 years from now, it's worth $10 million and you're still paying $1 million worth of tax. So it would, Obviously, some people think this is unfair. Others who are against this prop say the property tax can increase the overall cost of living and can make everything we buy more expensive. If property tax for a building is going to be more, they're probably going to charge the people who are renting that building more money for rent, which means we can pay more for clothes, for groceries, for other stuff. And people against this also say it can discourage people from buying buildings in California and starting new businesses. 
so a question I have for that is they're saying a no vote um, or the arguments for no is that like, oh, this could increase the price of everything, basically. Is yeah. that guaranteed or is that totally dependent on the business, o- the building owners, kind of? It's not guaranteed. It's dependent on okay. the business owners and whoever owns that property and if they want to charge their tenants more or not. Totally. But okay, that's I do want to make it clear. This is only for industrial and commercial buildings this would not increase property taxes on a home at all it wouldn't Mm -hmm. change anything so okay awesome cool well let's move on to prop 16. so what is prop 16 this would repeal the ban of affirmative action so this would allow diversity to be a factor when you know public employment hiring practices in education accepting applicants and in contracting decisions So, a yes vote for Prop 16 would remove Prop 209 from the state constitution, which was voted back in 1996, and this would once again allow public institutions to consider factors such as race and sex in education or employment if they so choose. A no vote would mean affirmative action would continue to be banned in California. So, the arguments for and against, for... It's a crucial step to level the playing field in hiring practices and in university um, acceptance rates. And this would put California more in line with the majority of the country, which is really important to note 42 states practice affirmative action and California is not one of those 42 states currently. Arguments against uh, accepting Prop 16 would be it's inherently discriminatory and people say it could hurt university applications among Asian Americans as currently they're the most they're overrepresented in the UC system. That's a really interesting proposition that I feel like Mm -hmm. a lot of people have opinions on. So interesting. I was going to say, and like, maybe I just was unaware. I didn't really know California didn't practice affirmative action currently. I didn't know it was banned back in 96. Next up, Prop 17, which restores the right to vote for people who are on parole. Another, I would say, a little controversial proposition on the ballot. So right now, the California Constitution allows someone on probation to vote, but it doesn't let someone on parole vote until their parole has been completed. So what's the difference between probation and being on parole? So probation is part of a sentence and can allow those convicted of a felony to avoid time behind bars. Parole starts when you're released from prison before your sentence ends. So a yes vote on this means people on the people on state parole who are U.S. citizens, residents of California, and are at least 18 years old and registered to vote will be able to vote. And a no vote means things would stay the same. People on parole won't be able to vote. So arguments for this say that this restores citizens' right to vote after they finish their prison term. They also say that some parolees are already working and they're paying taxes and they have a family, so they should be able to vote. Arguments against this say parolees are still completing their sentence and have yet to gain the trust of society. They also say this amends California's constitution to grant violent criminals the right to vote before completing their sentence. It's important to note that if this gets approved, it would follow a trend in other states to restore the right to vote for people on parole. And if this passes, it would affect about 40,000 people on parole in California. Wow. I was going to say, are there other states that currently do this? Yeah, there are. I don't know how many exactly, um, but there are. There's several other states that already do this. And, you know, California is progressive. So um, some people obviously are for this. Um, We'll see what happens. (laughs) Totally. Okay, well, moving on to Prop 18. So what is this? This would amend California's constitution, and this would permit 17-year-olds to vote in primary and special elections if they turn 18 by the next general election and be otherwise eligible to vote. Okay, so that's a lot of words. So basically, I'll explain it kind of uh, using myself as an example. So this year, if I were to turn 18, my birthday is in May. The primaries in California were in March. I would have been theoretically in this example 17. Whereas for the election, I would have been 18 by November. So this uh, prop would allow me to have been able to vote back in March, even though I was still 17, since I was turning 18 before the general election. So um, if a vote, that would be what a yes vote is. A vote no would be still say the same. You have to be 18 by the time you vote in whatever election it is. 
So arguments for this is it saying that this allows these people who are 17 who will be turning 18 by the general election to shape their choices and become more informed about their vote by the time they are voting for that general election. And people are saying, well, they should have a say in these issues that are affecting them and that they would be voting on anyway come November. Arguments against this, though, are saying, well, they're still legally minors. And then they also say teenagers' brains are still developing. So those are kind of the arguments for and against it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so next up is Prop 19, which changes certain property tax rules. Prop 19 is kind of like a three-in-one, if you say, because there's three different components to it. So... Component one, it would allow all California homeowners who are 55 or older to purchase a new home and keep their property tax payment at the same level or newly reduced rate depending on the value of their new home. It, number two, it also expands the property tax break to Californians who are severely disabled or who lost their home in a wildfire. Part three of this is that the measure would also crack down on when a parent gives their home to their adult child. Right now, when a parent gives their home to a child, the property tax doesn't change. This prop would narrow the tax break to homes being given by the owner and would place a new limit on how much of the homeowner's value remains unchanged when the property is inherited. A yes vote means all homeowners who are 55 or older and meet the qualifications would be eligible for tax savings when they move. It would also mean that it would offer the same type of property tax benefits to people who lost their home in a wildfire and it would crack down on property tax value when you're giving a home to someone else, to your child specifically. A no vote means nothing changes. Arguments for the prop say this can help older Californians move into a nicer home by offering a tax break. It also helps people impacted by wildfires and could bring in millions of dollars in property tax to local governments because it would be cracking down on the transfer of homes between families. Arguments against this say it's a billion dollar tax increase on families because it cracks down on low property taxes when the parent gives their home to a child. So I would say the arguments for and against are more people arguing on whether when you're giving your home to a child, they should reevaluate the property taxes or not, um, opposed to like, no one's really disagreeing that people who burn down, whose homes both burn down in a fire shouldn't get the tax benefits. So. Mm, okay, that makes sense. What do you know typically like what kind of groups are supporting for and what are supporting against? I would say the people who are wealthy are supporting are going to vote no or are more for no just because people who are wealthy tend to have more than one home. And so or they've had homes passed down for years. So like an example, Kylie Jenner, she has a million houses in California. Like she has at least three. And so when, if she only has Stormy, she's passing down the home to Stormy, like those houses, let's say go up in value, then they're not going to be, they have the property tax is going to change on it. So when she gets it. So if she bought a home, Kylie bought a home for 1 million in 2020. And then in 2045, she gives her home to Stormy. The house is now worth 10 million. They're going to reassess the property tax. And that's a yes. million that it's worth. So a yes would be reassessing that, and yeah, a no would a yes. be okay. Awesome. Exactly, and a no would be reassessing, and then a yes vote. People, if you vote yes, it also kind of helps because you know there is a housing issue in California, and there isn't a lot of affordable housing, which we will get to in another prop. <laughs> so stay tuned. Um, and so this would kind of help people that are fifty five and older, and maybe have been living in homes for a really long time, and they just can't afford to move, or they've been living in really bad areas. This would offer them a, a much needed tax break that people would say would help with the affordable housing issue that the, the state has. Totally. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I'm not like a tax person. I do not understand taxes. So you using that Kylie Jenner example, I'm like, okay, I get it. I hope <laughs> you're like, sense. if you have any other questions, let me know. Because I know it, like, it yes. kind of gets confusing with taxes, but yeah. Yeah, fine. oh, definitely. Okay. Well, without uh, further ado, or do, is that the word? Oh, do? I don't know. I don't know what that word is, but you know what I mean. <laughs> we will move on to Prop 20. So Prop 20, what is it? This would restrict parole for certain offenses currently considered to be nonviolent. And this would authorize felony sentences for certain offenses that are currently treated only as misdemeanors. Okay, so that's a little confusing. A yes vote means that certain crimes um, would be easier made, like they would be able to be considered felonies more easily rather than just 
misdemeanors, and it would prohibit early parole for more crimes. Okay, so this would also roll back portions of previous measures passed that were designed specifically to reduce California's state prison population. And this would also reclassify 17 different crimes that are currently considered nonviolent, and it would make them violent offenses now. So a no vote means that there would be no changes made, and measures that were passed in 2014 and 2016 would still stand. Okay, so it, it's still a little confusing, but arguments for <laughs> arguments for this is that like crimes such as domestic abuse, child trafficking, and rape would now be considered nonviolent because right now currently they're considered nonviolent offenses. And this would better help law enforcement solve crime. So they're kind of, it, it's just a huge like law enforcement mass incarceration type uh, prop that this is dealing with. So on the other hand, arguments against this are harsh sentencing and tough policies have not worked for California in the past. And I, I used LAist as a huge source during my whole research. And they were saying in LA right now, I mean, it's like the lowest crime they've seen. So it's like, it, it's kind of the question of like, okay, why are we kind of wanting to be tougher on crime when it's, it doesn't seem to have a need is what people arguing against it are saying. And people are also saying, I mean, right now we're in such a time with everything going on, the civil unrest, we're seeing that different communities are getting disproportionately affected by stuff like this. So that's such a huge thing to keep in mind too when looking at this prop. And um, people are saying, well, why aren't we focusing instead on how to keep crime rates low and how to keep our communities safe instead of pushing more funds into mass incarceration? Got it. Okay. So just to make sure I get it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so basically <laughs> this prop, prop 20, mm -hmm. would make crimes more, would, would turn nonviolent crimes into violent crimes. It wouldn't turn violent crimes into nonviolent crimes. No. So it's kind of moving, pushing more into like uh, more like harsher sentencing yeah like more okay. it's defining things more, more punishment heavily if that makes sense so yeah it's it's changing things that are currently uh, for example misdemeanors certain ones like burglary and stuff like that can now yeah. be moved into felonies which is like a harsher sentencing and then stuff that's considered non-violent which are obviously awful awful crimes like domestic abuse and child trafficking would be moved into this violent category instead of being not considered non-violent on a like a um what's it called like a judicial like stance yeah. okay that makes sense now mm -hmm. interesting thank you for explaining the arguments for and against i feel like that really mm -hmm. brought clarity so yeah, like definitely. People, what, how they're thinking about this. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. So we're going to move on to Prop 21. So this is a big measure on the ballot because it deals with a very real topic that people living in the state know, rent control. So last year, Governor Gavin Newsom signed a new rent control law that says most state landlords cannot increase rent by more than 5% per year plus inflation. He signed this law after California voters rejected a 2018 statewide rent control measure. So this is kind of like a check, a second try to get this prop passed. And there's another prop that's trying to get passed again that we'll skip to it towards the end. Um, so if this passes, cities and counties can put in place even stricter rent control policies. The rules on Prop 21 depends on how old the building is. So for example, if the building is 15 years or older, the new rent control can apply, but the rent control can go up when a new tenant moves in. So it's kind of like a double-edged sword, I guess you could say like, yeah, they can't really raise rent by more than 5% if the building's over 15 years old, but then the second that person moves out, they, and they move into a new building that's 15 years old, they can get a higher rent, or the second somebody takes over their spot, they can get a higher rent. Um, so that's something to consider. And then a yes vote for this means cities and counties can apply more types of rent control measures. A no vote means things stay the same. People for and against this prop agree that there isn't enough affordable housing in California, but they don't agree on if this prop is the right step towards getting more affordable housing in the state. People for this say the prop could help tackle the homeless issue and help provide more affordable housing for seniors, veterans, and young adults who are just starting their careers. People against this say it would reduce property value and stop new housing from being built. So long, oh sorry. 
Oh, no, you go, you go. <laughs> oh, okay. So long story short, what this basically would do is, like, there is a rent control law that was signed into place last year. This would just give cities and counties more authority on whether they can put even stricter rent control policies. So whether that be San Diego, L.A., Santa Barbara, whatever. So it would really depend on your city or county on how much it's changed or how you're affected by this. It would just give people, your local government, the authority to apply strict direct control if they want to. Mm, Okay, so could you give an example, if this were to pass, how this could affect, like, a senior or a veteran or a young adult, kind of like like an example of it? Yeah, so I live in LA County, so let's say this passes, and then they decide, the county decides, like, okay, so we're not going to let anybody raise rent more than 6% a year in the county. That means, like, I don't, fuck, I use 6%, that's kind of hard to, like, use in numbers. But, so your rent per year, theoretically, wouldn't be able to go up more than 6%. So, in a way, it helps it because they can't really raise it $100 or $200 if they want to. It's a much smaller increase, which would, in turn keep housing more affordable because if not people who are for this would for instance would say like oh well that means it's up to the landlord to raise rent however they want they're not being regulated if they want to raise it 50 percent they can that's legal if they want to raise it 75 percent they can't too which is what's keeping the prices for of housing so high the catch 22 is the phrase i would say or whatever like the the catch about this is that like whenever people move out that's where the landlords have a little bit more leeway of like, okay, so now I can raise it to what I wanted and then I can only charge them 5% or 6% more. So as long as you're living in the apartment and you don't really plan on moving for a while, then you really could be saving a lot of rent because opposed to getting a 50% increase every year, you're only getting a 5% increase or a 6% increase or whatever the county says. Um, mm-hmm. Does that does that help you? Does that help a lot? Yeah, I think that makes sense. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, now we'll move on to, honestly, this is the one that uh, I personally feel most passionate about, and this is probably one that you've seen because there's lots of advertisements for Prop 22, so let's talk about it. Okay, so what is it? Prop 22 would exempt app-based transportation and delivery companies, so think Uber, think Lyft, think Postmates, DoorDash. Um, This would exempt them from providing employee benefits to certain drivers. Okay, so voting yes, here's what it means. This would classify drivers for Uber, Lyft, and other app-based companies as independent contractors, and this would establish labor and wage policies that are tailored specifically for them. And we'll, we'll, I'll get a little more into it during the arguments for and against, but um, a no vote for Prop 22. So this isn't one of the ones that like, oh, things stay the same because how you're imagining um, like Ubers and Lyfts right now is what a yes vote would be in terms of anyone can go sign up to go drive for Uber or Lyft and become a worker for them and kind of make their own hours and make their own schedule. So a no vote for Prop 22, this would make workers who perform those duties essentials to the business they work for, such as a delivery driver for Postmates, this would make them employees, not contractors. And then now the company, if if you vote a no, a company would have to receive benefits and protections, or they would have to provide benefits and protections in accordance with the law. So every other employer you can think of, like if you go work for McDonald's, you're getting these um like cover benefits and kind of coverage from being part of that company, whereas currently and a yes vote for Prop 22 would mean uh, people who like are independent contractors for this company would be independent contractors and not employees. Okay, so here's the arguments for and against. So I just want to uh, say just to kind of put it more into context. The people supporting this are all the apps, all the Ubers, the Lyfts, the Postmates, the DoorDash, all of them. They have put um, $180 million plus into funding this and uh, advertising for it. And that's why you've probably seen it before. Um, I know this is the prop I've seen most of all of them. Okay, so arguments four is if we vote, uh, if we weren't to vote for this 
prop. This could put um, people out of work that work for Uber and Lyft. And many drivers who use the jobs as supplemental income to support their families would no longer have these flexible schedules. So for example, someone who works a full-time job but needs a little extra cash and like would just on the weekends drive for Lyft or just, you know, evenings, they're not able to necessarily have that flexible schedule if we weren't to pass Prop 22 is what the argument is. Now, the arguments against Prop 22, so voting no on Prop 22. See, this one's just confusing because it's like flip-flopped other than what your mind would think. Um, but arguments for no for Prop 22, um, they're saying we need to vote no because it doesn't give drivers sick leave, unemployment benefits, or workers comp. And it lets Uber, Lyft, and these other apps get away with not paying Social Security or Medicare to the state. And then this also would maximize the profits of apps and companies. Um, cause it would, mm -hmm. I mean, they don't have to treat their employees as employees. They can let them kind of figure out it for their own as independent yeah. contractors, if that makes sense. Okay. Again, like I, so I, just to make sure I get it. <laughs> yeah. So <basically, laughs> no, it's, this one's a, this one's a big one. It's a doozy for sure. Okay. So just to make sure I get it, prop 22, 24, prop 24, basically if you 22, vote, yes, 22. Am I crazy? Why did I think it was 24? Oh my god, I'm going to... I know, we're like, Sorry. what day is it? Everything's confusing. It's okay. <laughs> what are we... Okay. So, this prop would basically... If you vote yes, things stay the same. Yeah, it's it's basically, as you know, Lyft and Uber and all that to be. A yes is that. And so, by voting yes, that means, like, if I'm an Uber driver, I stay a freelancer. I stay deciding what hours I want to work, but the catch has how it's been this whole time is like, you don't get taxes taken out. You have to report it at the end and pay it. You don't get sick pay. You don't get vacation days. You don't get any health insurance at all. You have to figure that out on your own as a freelancer would in a normal job for the most part. Definitely. And that's that's such a big thing too right now is because, I mean, we, uh, so many of us were affected by it and are still being affected by it. I mean, when uh, like quarantine hit and the pandemic was really big and still is big in California, I mean, unemployment is huge right now. And when a lot of people were able to, I mean, whether they were furloughed or laid off, they were able to apply for these unemployment benefits and get that money coming in each week. But people who did lift and Uber or whatever they may be doing full time, um, they couldn't get any sort of unemployment benefits, even though maybe people weren't taking Ubers as much or they had a family that they had to take care of or themselves didn't want to get sick from coronavirus. I mean, they weren't able to get that unemployment benefits because they had to either continue doing it or decide to just not get paid anymore. So a no vote would change it and would make them employees if they... Yes. And they would give, therefore, they would get the benefits that you would in a normal job where you are a full-time employee. You would get sick pay. You would get vacation day. You would get insurance and all that stuff. Totally. And that's and that's the thing, too. It's like any other company you can imagine, basically, unless you're a, some sort of freelance writer or freelance graphic designer, whatever. Every other company that you are an employee for is works this way except for these app based companies and the reason for that is because their whole thing has been oh like si you can sign on any time i mean i have never driven for any of these companies but i did sign up last year to drive for postmates because i was thinking of doing it and i mean i still i haven't done it yet i all i did was basically sign up and i was able to go drive for them and so it's like there's not i mean there's no sort of really training period you can just hop on and do it and that was kind of the whole appeal of uber lyft and everything but that's what an argument no would be trying to change mm-hmm Yes, I know. It's it's a it's a big one. <laughs> It'll yeah. be interesting to see what happens because I honestly have no idea what uh, will yeah. be voted on for that. And it's a tricky one, too. So people could be voting for something and then they don't realize if they don't really let, read what's happening, that they're, what they're totally. voting for. Cool. So now Prop 23. This prop might sound familiar, and that's because it is, if you voted in the November 2018 election, you probably voted for this prop. So it's a second, it's the second straight November election in which California voters will be asked to approve a new law governing kidney dialysis clinics in the state. 
There are over 600 kidney dialysis clinics in the state and they serve about 80,000 patients a month. In order to see all patients and address all their needs, the clinics need to stay open for long hours and usually six days a week. So the ballot measure would require every clinic to have at least one physician present during all operating hours. It would also prohibit clinics from reducing services without state approval. It would also prohibit clinics from refusing to treat patients regardless of whether the treatment is paid for by private insurance or a government funded program. And clinic administrators would have to report more information about infections among their dialysis patients. So a yes vote means all the changes I just spoke about before two seconds ago would take effect. A no vote means everything would stay the same. So by things staying the same, that means there doesn't have to be a physician present during operating hours. They don't have to report how many infections they get at the dialysis clinics, etc. So people for the proposition say this would help combat poor hygiene in dialysis clinics by requiring infection reporting. It would also improve staffing and stop discrimination based on the patient's insurance. People against this say it would force several clinics to shut down, threatening thousands of dialysis patients because it would change the way they operate. Mm. So who are the people supporting it typically and who are the people kind of not supporting it? So the union, the union of pe- for the people who work in these clinics are actually the ones who are sponsoring it and they're the ones who want um, you to say yes. So they, because it would benefit the workers because it would just basically help make sure, it would make everything safer in a way because you have to report how many infections there are. It would stop discrimination against like, oh, you have Medicaid and you have another insurance private. It would also just like, make sure that there's actually a physician, a clinical physician there at all operating hours, which would in turn be an extra person or maybe two extra people that could help people working at the clinics. Um, And then people against this are mainly people who own these clinics because they're like, well, now we're going to have to pay for an extra person. And now we're going to have to report all these things where before they they could have been sweeping it under the rug. So this... From what I've read, this doesn't necessarily change the type of treatment you're getting. Like if you're getting certain dialysis stuff, like I don't know anything about dialysis to be honest. If you're getting certain dialysis stuff, like it's not going to change your treatment at all. But because the clinics would now have to be regulated more, it could cause some to shut down. Which is also why some people are like, you should vote no because... There's 80,000 patients, I want to say, that are getting treated by this a month. Yeah, 80,000 patients a month, which is a lot of people in the state. So if clinics were to shut down, that would leave a lot of people without this, which is a necessity for them. So it it would honestly depend on the clinics and how big of a hit they take. But the argument for is like it, it does make things safer and better for these patients in the long run. Mm-hmm. Mm, Okay, that's interesting. Is it one of those, because I know we talked about this with Prop 15 in terms of like, um, that one was kind of about, okay, like, if if taxes are raised on these properties and these business properties, like, uh, the argument, one of the arguments against was, oh, like, everything could in turn be more expensive. Do we, but you said that's not guaranteed. Is this something that, okay, clinics would for sure shut down? Or is it like, oh, we don't know. That's just like, it could happen. It could happen. I think okay. clinics are using that could as a driving factor of why people should vote no. Okay, that makes sense. Got it. Because they, I mean, in theory, they would have to be paying more to, to mm-hmm. hire an extra person or two extra people. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it just depends how many patients they have. But also on the flip side is if there are 80,000 patients in California for this and there's 600 clinics, like they probably have more than enough patients that, that they can get their hands on. So that makes sense. Okay, that's good to know. It, it really helps, like, contextualize it when you see, like, who's for, who's against, you know? Like, yeah. that makes sense. Okay, cool. Well, we will move on. We have two more left. We'll move on to Prop 24. I will say, of all the ones that I've personally named, this is by far the most confusing. And to be quite honest with you, I think it was meant to be confusing. So, what is Prop 24? So, this would amend consumer privacy laws. So, 
This would add new provisions to a current law on consumer data privacy and create an agency for its implementation and enforcement. So what does that mean? Okay, well, a yes vote would mean um, consumers could request businesses to shop, stop sharing their personal information. It would create a new category of sensitive personal information, and it would allow consumers to restrict the use by businesses. And it would also give triple the amount of penalties for violations when it concerns people under 16. It would establish an agency tasked with enforcing these new rules. And, and I think this is a big one, honestly, it would change the law um, that would require approval and it would require approval of voters for changing this law rather than allowing legislator to change it at its will when it sees a need to. So what a no vote means is nothing changes from the law concerning this that was passed back in 2018. Okay, it really is confusing. It's really convoluted. It's a lot. And I will say this prop in particular was over 50 pages, which I personally did not read. I used a guide because I was not going to read it, but it's very, very, very convoluted. And honestly, it's meant to be convoluted. So why are people arguing for this prop? They're saying this is necessary for consumers to have more control over kind of their privacy data. And this would expand consumer rights. This would increase transparency from businesses and this would hold them accountable. Okay, arguments against it. Are they saying this is too much of a mixed bag for consumer privacy? And there's kind of within, there's kind of little giveaways for companies to make use of kind of your personal data. And this would expand businesses' ability to refuse to delete consumers' information. So it's kind of like there's little loopholes all throughout, and that's kind of a huge thing to take into account. And I also want to say, like, uh, an argument against this wasn't in there, but based on my understanding of it, changing the law to require approval of voters rather than allowing legislator to change it at its will could really be an argument against, too, because, I mean, the average person... Like you and I are researching hardcore into these props. I don't I don't know if the average person does. I don't think they do. And something like this, after all this research, I still do not really understand privacy laws. And so making it to be the consumer or the voters have a say in it and are the only ones who can change it rather than it being legislator and people who are in it is could be, I mean, a pro or a con, depending how you look at it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that's such a good point that you just brought up. This mm -hmm. is a confusing one for sure. Oh, for sure. <laughs> like, for sure. This is probably, of all of them, the most con confusing one. Yeah. Okay. Great. I think I think you explained it pretty well, though, so I feel like... Oh my god, good! <laughs> so I feel like I don't have any follow-up questions for that last for once. <laughs> I'm so glad! Oh my god, I didn't know if I would, con like, explain it well. I'm very glad. Okay, cool. <laughs> oh, wait, I guess I kind of have a question. Oh, yes, yes. So a no vote mm -hmm. means consumer, uh, not consumer, we would have to vote every single time a consumer privacy law or what, or like an amendment to this would, like, would come up. Correct. That would be on us to okay. vote for, and that is not something legislate, uh, legislator can change. So another thing that the LAist referred to as well, they're saying, for instance, this would also allow businesses to kind of withhold discounts from consumers unless they agree to let the business collect and share uh, certain data about their habits. So for example, you know how if you go to, I don't know, forever21.com and it pops up and it says, hey, 10% discount code. A lot of times you have to, you know how you just have to give your email and that's the only thing you do. They're saying yeah. this could allow businesses to be like, okay, give us more, accept these like conditions, give your data. And in turn, it could collect mm -hmm. more data from you just by like kind of tricking the average person into here's a coupon code. Now we can get your data type thing. God. And that's for a no vote. And that's for a yes vote. Yes vote. Mm -hmm. oh, so that's an argument against. It. Yeah. So that's an argument against this prop. So I feel like there's a winning on this prop. Yeah, it's it's very confusing because it's basically like, it, I mean, there's pros and cons to both sides, but adding this prop is basically like, oh, it gives the consumer more control. However, 
does the consumer know they need that control, if that makes sense? That's kind of my interpretation of it. It's like, cause I, I mean, I go on a website if it asks to see my cookies or whatever, like, I don't know what that means. You know what I mean? Like the, the average person really does not know what it means. And so by, by saying yes on this prop, yes, it can give you more control, but you can also easily lose control Got without even knowing it. it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think I got it. It's 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 a confusing one. It's meant to be confusing. That's all I can say. If y'all are confused, it's doing its job. Okay. <laughs> Did its job. Um Okay, so now we're gonna move on to prop 25, the last prop on the California ballot. We made it. Woohoo! <laughs> So Prop 25 is referendum, which means it's a special kind of ballot measure that asks voters to approve or reject a law passed by the legislator. In this case, it's the fate of a 2018 law abolishing cash bail in California. So two years ago, the state legislator passed a law getting rid of cash bail. But before the law could go into effect, companies representing the bail industry gathered enough signatures to put the law on hold until this election, where voters will decide whether to accept it or reject it. If the prop passes, it would eliminate cash bail, which requires someone to pay a cash bond in order to get released while they are waiting for their trial. Instead, the person waiting trial would be detained based on new risk assessments. So like if a judge thinks they could be a danger to society. A yes vote means no one would pay bail to be released from jail before a trial. Instead, they would be released automatically or based on their assessed risk of committing another crime or putting someone's safety at risk. A no vote means things will stay the same. Nothing confusing about that for this one. Um, so those four Prop 25 say the cash bill system focuses too much on if someone can pay to get out before their trial but, and it prioritizes like if someone can pay over someone's safety and over the public safety. And that this law could put into effect a more fair and safer, less costly process. People against it say this is written by politicians to take away California's option to post bail and replace it with a discriminatory system of profiling. So important to know, bail bond, the bail bond industry is against this. Obviously, they would lose some. They would lose their industry basically if this was passed. Um, so, very interesting. Basically, the key takeaway: a yes vote would get rid of cash bail system. So, if you get arrested and you have to wait 15 days before your trial, you will not be allowed to pay whatever the bond is to get out or the bail is to get out. Instead, you would either be automatically released or you would get assessed based on several assessments which some of them are how often you are to do this crime again or if you are putting someone's life or the community's life at risk and no vote things stay the same you still have the option to pay bail and if you can't afford bail you're staying in jail until trial mm. so who kind of decides whether like someone's risk factor of doing another crime and kind of all that stuff how's that decided from my understanding it would be a judge Okay. So it basically puts this into the, the judge's hands. Mm -hmm. um, so people against this, the bail bond industry is mainly against this. And they're saying like, well, for the most part, statistically, minorities get arrested more. And so therefore, like you're just discriminating them more. Um, and by saying like, are you going to do this again? Are you going to commit this crime? So, but people for it are just like, well, it shouldn't be based on whether or not you have money or not. Like if you did a terrible crime, but you can afford to pay bail, that doesn't mean you should be go to, you should be allowed to go free. Mm. Did that make sense? It does make sense. See, it's, this one seems really like, <laughs> like convoluted too. Cause it's one of those things where like, I would think a lot of systemic racism would come into play by letting a judge just mm -hmm. decide. But I would also think, I mean, the point about the money thing makes sense too, because that's also an access thing too. So it's, I'm very like, I don't know. Who, who is support, who's supporting uh, this prop? Um, it's, a, it's well, it was put on by the le legislator. So California Democratic um, politicians are for it. Okay. Um, they're the ones, the legislators, the one who put it on, and the bail bond industry 
paused it because they were able to get enough signatures in a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. So, and, and to your point, it is totally true because either way for or against this kind of does discriminate a certain type of group like mm -hmm. if this gets approved and it's all based on risk assessment then like if a judge is racist they can just keep you in jail because mm -hmm. until your trial because you're hispanic or black mm -hmm. or whatever but at the same time like typically hispanics and blacks don't have as much money and may not be able to afford bail mm -hmm. so they regardless stay in jail until trial right. so it's it is kind of like a double-edged sword i think um but that but yeah sense. the legislators for it and bail bot industries against it. Mm -hmm. Totally, that makes sense. Well, those are our uh, props for y'all. <laughs> Where I, I mean, I hope this was informative for some people. But before we go, we want to remind you of some key voting deadlines in California. Of course, by now you know that the election is coming up on Tuesday, November third. And if you're registering, registering to vote online, the deadline is going to be October 19th. If you're registering to vote by mail, your registration form must be postmarked by October 19th. But good news, California offers in-person same-day registration. So you can register to vote in person until November 3rd. And every person registered to vote in California will get a vote by mail ballot. This one right here. Ooh, oh, I should have... Mine's over there. <laughs> <laughs> you have until November 3rd to turn in the ballot, either in person at a polling location or by mail. It is important to note if you're returning it by mail, it must be postmarked by November 3rd. So a recommendation, either make sure you put it outside your house so the mailman can pick it up a day or two before the election, or if you're going to wait until November 3rd, go to the post office and ask them to postmark it so you make sure that you don't have any issues. And also when you return the ballot, it is prepaid. So you do not need a stamp. You do not need to pay anything except maybe gas to get to the post office. <laughs> <laughs> and then here are some tips to make sure your vote counts if you're voting by mail. So first of all, the signature on your ballot must match your DMV signature. But if your signature doesn't match, don't worry because the state is required to cure any challenge to your ballot. So, for example, if something's wrong with your signature, the state is then required to contact you and give you options on how to fix that. Exactly. And California also offers electronic barcode ballot tracking services. So you can track your ballot to make sure it gets counted. To keep tabs on your ballot, go to whereismyballot.sos.ca.gov. Whoo, that was a mouthful. Um, <laughs> to make sure your ba ballot gets counted. All right, everyone, that does it for us this week. And of course, we'll be posting all of this on Instagram. So make sure to share with your friends, get everyone to be civically engaged, do all the things you need to do. And of course, you can find us on Instagram at what a week show on Twitter at what a week show underscore. And on YouTube, you can find us at what a week with Alex and Emily. Yes. And I, I know you all listen to us. I'm sure you all love us, all that stuff. But make sure, please, that you are also doing other research outside of just us and do your part to be engaged and in the know. You know how it is. But if you, know you liked this episode, please leave us a review on iTunes. We would love that. And if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure to like, subscribe, share with your friends, turn on the post ball notifications, and leave a comment down below on if you liked this video, if you thought it was helpful for you, and on anything else you guys want to talk about next week. Yes, talk to y'all next time. Bye. Bye.